Hi everyone, welcome to Lab 7, Bone Basics. Today you'll begin studying the skeletal system, and during the next few weeks you'll look at each of the bones that make up the human skeleton, study the types of joints between them, and learn how the skeletal and muscular systems work together to allow your body to move. Before you begin looking at specific bones, though, we need to discuss some basic information regarding bones. So in today's podcast, we'll focus on structure and function of bone, we'll talk about how bones are classified, and we'll define several important terms that you'll need to know as you begin looking at the specific details of the bones that make up the body. So let's begin by first defining bone. Okay, you should remember from your unit on histology that bone is a special type of connective tissue, and it's composed of both organic and inorganic components. The organic components of bone include bone cells and osteoid. Osteoid is the organic part of the extracellular matrix. The majority of bone, however, is composed of inorganic mineral salts called hydroxyapatites. Those hydroxyapatites are very important because they give bone its characteristic hardness. An example of a hydroxyapatite that you find in bone is calcium phosphate. There are 206 total bones in the body. And this number can actually vary from one person to the next. Uh, for example, some individuals are born with extra or missing vertebrae. However, the standard number of bones that we find in the body is 206. So if you see a question on a test or a quiz that asks you how many bones there are in the body, this number here, 206, um, is the standard number. So this is what we're looking for in that case. Uh, but just keep in mind that the actual number of bones may vary from one person to the next. Okay, for the ease of study, those 206 bones are divided into two categories, the bones of the axial skeleton and the bones of the appendicular skeleton. The axial skeleton includes the bones of the skull, the vertebral column, and the thoracic cage, and the appendicular skeleton is composed of the bones of the upper and lower limbs, so the bones of the arms and the legs, as well as their girdles, the bones that attach the arms and legs to the main trunk of the body. There are five major functions of bone that you should be familiar with, and they are support, protection, movement, mineral storage, and hematopoiesis. Okay, let's talk about each of those five major functions in more detail, beginning with support. The skeleton is the main framework of the body, so in other words, it's the skeleton that gives the body its basic structure. And this basic frame is responsible for supporting the weight of your body. So without the skeleton, your body would have no structural support for the tissues of your body, and you would essentially be a big blob of tissue. So we can see here why the support function is very important. Okay, bone is also important because it forms a protective case around many vital organs. For example, the skull forms a helmet-like case that surrounds and protects the brain and special sensory structures, including the eyes and the structures of the ear. The vertebral column surrounds and protects the spinal cord. The thoracic cage surrounds and protects very important organs, including your heart and your right and left lungs. And the pelvis forms a protective girdle around the reproductive organs and several urinary structures like the bladder. So the protective function of bone, obviously very important. Okay, the third major function of bone that you should know is movement. Together with the muscular system, the skeletal system forms a system of forces and levers that allows the body to move. Okay, for example, the figure um, here shows you the biceps muscle and its attachment to the skeleton. Okay, when the biceps contracts, it causes the flexion of the arm at the elbow joint. So it's the skeleton and the muscular system that work together uh, to allow your body to move individual parts and to move as a whole. The fourth major function of bone is mineral storage. Okay, we mentioned earlier that bone is composed largely of inorganic mineral salts like calcium phosphate. And in fact, bone is a warehouse for both calcium and phosphorus. The skeleton and the endocrine systems work very closely together to maintain a balance between input and output of these minerals to ensure that there's a proper concentration of them within the extracellular environment. 
For example, if the level of calcium in your blood drops too low, a hormone is produced that causes the release of calcium from the bones into the surrounding environment. So the mineral storage function of bone here is very, very important. The last major function of bone is hematopoiesis. Okay, hematopoiesis is the process of blood cell formation. And remember that blood cells are produced from stem cells in the bone marrow called hematopoietic stem cells. And again here we can see a, a figure here of red blood cells, which are formed through the process of hematopoiesis in the red bone marrow. Okay, you are responsible for knowing the five major functions of bone that we've just discussed here. So before you move on, make sure you're comfortable with this information. All right, moving on, let's talk about bone structure. Okay, the structure of bones can be studied on three levels, chemical, microscopic, and gross. Now, we've already discussed the chemical structure of bone. Okay, remember we said that bone is composed of organic components and inorganic mineral salts called hydroxyapatites. And you've already studied the microscopic structure of bone when you studied histology. So the picture that you see in the middle of the screen there should look familiar. So, from this point forward, we're going to focus our attention on the gross anatomy of bones. Okay, when we study gross anatomy of bones, we look at each of the bones in the body and identify all the ridges and bumps and grooves and other structures on the bone that we can see without the use of a microscope. Okay, all of these bumps and ridges and so forth are called bone markings. Okay, in your handouts, you have two charts that define and illustrate examples of each of the bone markings you'll be studying as you study each individual bone. So we will discuss each of those terms and look at several examples as we continue. The first group of bone markings that we'll discuss are markings that serve as points of attachment for muscles and ligaments. And the first term on your list there is a tuberosity. A tuberosity is a large round process and it usually has a very rough texture and appearance. A good example of a tuberosity you find at the proximal end of the tibia, and we'll highlight that in the figure here with the red arrow. This particular tuberosity is important because it serves as the point of attachment for the patellar ligaments. In other words, the ligaments that attach the kneecap or the patella to the foreleg attach here at the tibial tuberosity. The next term on your list is a crest. A crest is a narrow ridge of bone that's usually very prominent. A good example of a crest we find again on the tibia, and you can see that labeled in the figure here as the anterior crest, which we'll highlight with the red arrow. Now you can actually feel the anterior crest of the tibia if you run your fingers down your foreleg. Okay, you can feel that ridge of bone all the way down to your ankle. If you've ever hit your shin, okay, what you hit there is the anterior crest of the tibia. Okay, and you can feel that there's very little tissue that surrounds it. So basically what you have there is just skin on bone. Okay, so if you do hit your shin, it's going to hurt. The next term on your list is a trochanter. Okay, trochanters are large, irregularly shaped processes, and the only place in the body where you find a trochanter is on the femur. We'll highlight the trochanters there in the figure. Okay, the trochanters serve as points of attachment for muscles of the thigh and buttocks. Notice that in the figure there, between the two trochanters, there is a, another bone marking labeled uh, called the intertrochanteric line. Okay, a line is very similar to a crest in that it's a narrow ridge of bone, but the main difference between a line and a crest is that a line is much less prominent. And we'll highlight the line there with a red arrow. So whereas with a crest, which we can easily see and identify and feel, okay, identifying and locating a line is a little more difficult because it's not as prominent as is a crest. The next term on the list is a tubercle. A tubercle is a small round process. You see an example of a tubercle at the distal end of the femur. 
Okay, that tubercle there is labeled the adductor tubercle. It's called the adductor tubercle because there are muscles that attach to it that adduct or move the thigh or move the leg toward the midline of the body. The next term on the list is epicondyle. An epicondyle is an, a raised area that's on or above a condyle. And a condyle is a rounded articulation point on a bone. Okay, we'll take a closer look at a condyle when we look at our next set of bone markings. The next term on the list there is a spine. A spine is a sharp, slender, pointed projection, and the best example we see on the vertebrae, okay, which we'll highlight here with the arrow. The last term on the list here is a ramus. A ramus is defined as being an arm-like bar of bone. And the best example of a ramus we'll see on the mandible, uh, which we'll see in the next set of photos. So let's go ahead and move on to our next slide. And notice here we've highlighted the ramus of the mandible with the red arrow. You'll also see um, examples of rami on the os coxi or pubic bones. But just keep in mind that a ramus is defined as being an arm-like bar of bone. Okay, the next set of bone markings that we'll discuss are markings that help form joints. And notice that on the mandible I've underlined the term condyle. A condyle, which we mentioned um, on the previous slide, is a rounded articulation projection. Okay, so in other words, it's a bone that has a rounded edge to it. Okay, and again, a good example we find here on the mandible. Okay, the back condyle on that mandible um, fits into the skull and forms a movable joint that allows you to talk and chew and that sort of thing. So remember that a condyle is a rounded articulation point on a bone. Okay, the next two terms on the list there are head and facet. Okay, a head is a bony expansion uh, that you find carried on a narrow neck. A good example you see is uh, on the ribs. Okay, and at the end of the head of the rib are facets, which are smooth, flat articulation surfaces. Okay, the facets indicate points where um, the rib will fit together with another bone. In the case of the rib, the bones that it articulates with at the facets are the vertebrae. And we'll highlight the rib there. The next group of bone markings are depressions that allow for blood vessels and nerves to pass through. The first term on your list is a meatus. A meatus is a canal-like passageway. Okay, you see an example of meatus um, labeled in the uh, figure at the bottom of the screen. Um, a good example of a meatus is the external acoustic meatus, also known as your external ear canal. Okay, the next term on your list is a sinus. A sinus is a hollow cavity in bone. Um, sinuses are lined with mucous membrane and they're filled with air. Okay, sinuses serve two main functions. Um, they serve to lighten the skull and they serve as resonance chambers for speech. The next term on your list is a fossa. A fossa is a shallow basin-like depression. You see two examples of a fossa when viewing the uh, cranial floor. The most anterior of those two fossa is called the anterior cranial fossa, and it's where the frontal lobes of the brain sit. And the posterior cranial fossa is where the cerebellum of the brain sits. So as you begin studying the axial skeleton and looking more closely at the skull, remember that a fossa is a shallow basin-like depression in the bone. The next term on your list is a groove. A groove is a slit-like furrow, and grooves allow for blood vessels and nerves to pass along a bone. A fissure is a narrow slit-like opening. In the figure, uh, at the bottom of the screen here, you see the inferior orbital fissure labeled. The inferior orbital fissure allows for um, the, the passage of nerves. And finally, the last term on the list here is foramen. A foramen is a round or oval opening through a bone. 
and there are several foramina in the skull, and those foramina allow for the passage of both blood vessels and nerves. All of the bone markings that we've just defined in the two charts uh, that you see on the, on the screen and in your handouts um, are terms that you should commit to memory, okay, because you'll be using those terms um, as you study each individual bone. So all of these terms are terms that you need to know. So before you begin studying bones, commit all of these terms to memory and have a general idea of what each term means and a basic example of each. All right, let's move on and talk about the gross anatomy of bone. Okay, bone is divided into two categories based on texture, compact bone and cancellous bone. Cancellous bone is commonly called spongy bone, and it's a composed of many bony spicules called trabeculae. Okay, the figure that you see on the screen here shows you an up-close section of one of the bones of the skull. The compact bone forms the outer edge of the of the bone, uh, which we'll highlight here with the red arrow. Notice that compact bone appears to be a completely solid mass of bone, uh, whereas the spongy bone in the center appears riddled with holes. Okay, the blown up version of the spongy bone at the bottom of the figure gives you a better idea of the actual structure of spongy bone. Okay, notice all the trabeculae that form and surround the many holes. Okay, in living bone, these spaces are uh, filled with red or yellow bone marrow. Before moving on, make sure you're able to distinguish between compact and spongy bone. Classifying bones. Okay, bones are classified based on shape, and using this criterion, we can divide the 206 bones of the body into six categories. Long bones, short bones, flat bones, irregularly shaped bones, sesamoid bones, and wormian bones. Okay, let's take a closer look at each category and a few examples of each. All right, first up are long bones. Okay, long bones are longer than they are wide, and they have two distinct ends, called epiphyses, which are connected by a central shaft called the diaphysis. Okay, an example of a long bone is the femur, which you see in the figure here. Okay, other examples of long bones include the tibia, the fibula, humerus, radius, and ulna. Okay, there are also long bones with shorter dimensions, including the metacarpals, the metatarsals, and the phalanges. Okay, so the bones of the hand and the finger are also long bones. Okay, we'll focus a little more closely on the structure of long bones in the next section. So we'll go ahead and move on to the next category of uh, bone, which is short bone. Okay, short bones are cuboidal in shape, and you find short bones in areas um, that are subject to quite a bit of pressure. So examples of places where you'll find short bones include the wrist and the ankle. Short bones are composed of spongy bone uh, with a thin shell of compact bone on the outside. Examples, again, of short bones are the tarsals and the carpals, which you see here in the figure on the screen. The next category of bones are flat bones. An example of a flat bone is the scapula, which you see in the figure. Okay, flat bones are composed of a layer of spongy bone sandwiched between an inner and outer layer of compact bone. In addition to the scapula, the skull bones, the sternum, and the ribs are also flat. Irregular bones are uh, complex bones um, whose um, shape really doesn't fit into any of the other categories. Examples of irregular bones include the bones of the face and the vertebrae. Okay, 
Notice here how the shape of the vertebra is very different um, than the uh, shapes of the long, short, and flat bones, which we've already looked at. The next category of bones are sesamoid bones. Okay, sesamoid bones are actually a special type of short bone that develops within a tendon. Okay, sesamoid bones are found in areas of significant pressure, and the best example of a sesamoid bone is this one here. Uh, this bone is the patella or the kneecap. Okay, the last group of bones are the wormian bones. Wormian bones are commonly called sutural bones, and we find wormian bones between certain bones of the skull. Okay, so in the figure here, you see two wormian bones highlighted with the red arrow. As you begin studying all of the bones in the body, you should be able to classify the bones into one of the six categories listed here. There are seven major parts of a long bone, and they are the diaphysis, epiphysis, epiphyseal plate, articular cartilage, periosteum, medullary cavity, and endosteum. Okay, let's define each part of the long bone as we look at the figure at the right-hand side of the screen. Okay, the first major part of a long bone is the diaphysis. Okay, the diaphysis is the central portion of the long bone, or the shaft of the bone, and it's composed of compact bone. And this compact bone gives uh, the shaft of the bone considerable strength. So it's the diaphysis that provides the main support and strength for the long bone overall. Located at each end of the long bone are the epiphyses. Okay, the red arrow that you see here highlights the proximal epiphysis. Okay, the epiphyses, or the ends of the long bones, are composed of spongy bone covered with a thin layer of compact bone. The spaces of the spongy bone there are filled with bone marrow. Again, that bone marrow may be either red or yellow. And the epiphyses are important because they're attachment points for muscles, and they also serve as the uh, junction between bones uh, forming joints. Again, the end that you see labeled here with the red arrow is the proximal epiphysis, and at the opposite end is the distal epiphysis. Located between the proximal epiphysis and the diaphysis is the epiphyseal plate. The epiphyseal plate is a um, cartilaginous disc. It's composed of hyaline cartilage um, that's serves as the point of growth for the long bone. Okay, the epiphyseal plate is commonly referred to as the growth plate, and another term that you'll see used uh, interchangeably with growth plate and epiphyseal plate is metaphysis. Okay, so the epiphyseal plate is very important. It's the point of growth of the long bone. Covering the ends of long bones uh, are cartilaginous discs known as articular cartilage. Again, these cartilaginous discs are made of hyaline cartilage and they serve to cushion joints. Covering the outer surface of the bone is a specialized connective tissue called the periosteum. The periosteum is important because it's the point of attachment for tendons and ligaments. Located in the center of the diaphysis is a hollow cavity called the medullary cavity, and this is the space where bone marrow is found. In adults, this space is typically filled with yellow bone marrow. In children, however, uh, the medullary cavity is generally filled with red bone marrow. Lining the inside of the medullary cavity is a special connective tissue called the endosteum. Okay, knowing the structure of the long bone is typically um, 
emphasized more when you begin looking at the appendicular skeleton. And you will be responsible for the structure of the long bone on the test covering the appendicular skeleton. So make sure you understand the major parts of the long bone and be able to label a figure uh, similar to the one that, as we've done here in the podcast. All right, that concludes our introduction to bones. For homework, you should complete the labeling of the long bone and the bone basics questions. Be sure to consult your syllabus to ensure that you um, submit your assignment on time. Okay, afterwards, you should begin studying the bones of the skeleton, starting with the axial skeleton. Now, because labs are um, traditionally a hands-on learning experience when it comes to bones, the podcast format does not lend itself well to covering that material. Consequently, you are responsible for completing the lab handouts on the axial and appendicular skeleton and using all available resources to study the 206 bones of the body. You should be able to identify all of the bones and their bone markings, and you are responsible for all of the information contained in your lab handouts. Okay, if you have any questions or concerns as you begin studying, please let me know.